Welcome to the Channel Chat Podcast. Proudly sponsored by Convergent Technology. Hello, I'm Mark Sumner, host of the Channel Chat Podcast show. And today I have the pleasure in the virtual studio, because he has got COVID today, of leading <laughs> school, the MD of UK of South and Europe uh, for Nuvius Group. How are we doing, Lee? I'm good, Mark. How are you? How are you? Very good. Well, Actually, I am, to be honest, I am COVID free. It, it's the people around me. So you I thought I better not. Yeah, I thought I better not spread happy. potential germs, but I'm good, mate. Thank you. How are you? I'm, I'm good. It's a shame we, are, we can't get you in the studio today, but we'll, I'm sure we'll meet up at another, another time. Um, Absolutely. Especially when you get that new studio. Yeah, exactly. Oh, exactly. That, that won't be long. You'll be out for four or five weeks and we should be, we should be ready to rock. Um, Look forward to it. Lee, thanks for coming on the show. Um, I know we've sort of tried to arrange this a, a couple of times, but I'm keen to, to kick off really with. Um, your career in in um, IT because I looked on your LinkedIn today and I thought, damn, I didn't know he had eleven years at Computer Centre. And I thought, what did he do beforehand? Because originally, if I'm right, you are from Birmingham. Is that right? How do you know? How could you possibly? <laughs> I, am, I, am, I am indeed. Yeah. So, so, so tell me, you know, how, how how did you kick off your your IT sales career? Where did it start? Yeah, by accident, really, as, as a lot of things are. I think in life, we um, I did A levels and, and decided I didn't want to do university. I had, a, I had a place to go and do law actually at Liverpool, and I just didn't want to do it. And I think some of that was growing up in a in a university city and very close to, to Birmingham University, and I really wanted to earn some money and get a car and go on nice holidays and all those things. And I went through a very lengthy interview process with, with NatWest for their management uh, development program. And, and to be honest with you, I got in and I actually hated it. And, and I did just under a year of servitude, realising that <laughs> the exotica of the banking world was probably not for me. Um, we thought we were going to be a bank manager. I yeah, can't see that. Yeah, I know. Crazy. No, neither could I. I, I, I do remember my, when I resigned, my dad, I thought my dad was going to kill me. Because he was from the generation of, oh, my God, you've got a job in a bank. It's so safe. It's all yeah. these sorts of things and, and, and thought I was was crazy. And, um, and and he might have been right. But at the time, I was living with with my cousin in Birmingham. So I was living with Steve Rafferty, who's been in the channel a long, long time, 32 years. Steve is my cousin and, and was uh, at SCC at the time. Um, and he'd started his career at ETC, so SCH's distribution business. And he said to me, you'll be fine in sales. You know, and, it, and distribution's a great grounding and, and all the rest of it. Let me talk to, to the guys there and see if we can get you an interview. And, and lo and behold, he did. And, and the rest, they say, is history. And that'll be uh, 30, 30 years this May, actually. That, that so, will have been. So Steve Rafferty, UK country manager of Ring Central. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's got an international job, actually, with them now. But yes, oh, that's Steve, yeah. Yeah. And 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 he and he got you into the IT industry. So it's really he did, yeah. you, you would have been nothing without Steve, basically. Is that what I, I, I I would be and am nothing without Steve, <laughs> as, as he off, as he often reminds me. Uh, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to get Steve on the show. He'd be a great guest as well. But uh, yeah, I've got so, some so, stories about him as well, though. So he'll have to be careful. <laughs> um, so then you obviously started in, in in computer center. Tell me about your career when you, how you got in there because they are the number one bar in the country. Obviously, you would have been access to Mike Norris as well. So, t tell me about your yeah. career there. How? Because it, it seems a, it seems a great company to work for. Yeah, it was. Um, to be honest, when I was at ETC and, and got my grounding in distribution, <clears throat> about two years in, a couple of us were actually approached to go and and, and start um, or try and actually start would be unfair. Evolve what became CCD Computer Centers Distribution Business. Remember, yeah. yeah. Um, if you kind of remember the early to mid 90s, the, the whole vibe of the whole channel was have a really big warehouse yeah. and have the biggest stock in and buying relationship with the core vendors, you know, like IBM and Compaq as, as was back then, as, yeah. you, as you possibly can. Um, and Computer Center already had a small trade business uh, <coughs> based out of their, their, their Radlett location. And a few of us just went across to really kickstart that ccd business in earnest and i think there was five of us at the start maybe six um and we were there just selling toshiba and compaq and <laughs> printers and Madge network cards for those of you who remember them and all, all sorts of things and 
and really trying to build up this credible uh, distribution. I mean, it was even called trade back then, um, trade business. And, and, you know, we we were very fortunate, those of us that went, and me in particular, that we went through that whole process of, of Computer Centre being a very, very, um, I guess, evangelical in a way company. You know, the sales conferences were legendary. You really got a buzz and felt you were part of, of something. And I think... You know, I've seen many companies try, and I'm sure some have been very successful, but I always felt, you know, you talked about Mike earlier, you know, Mike's stage presence, his delivery, all those sorts of things was really inspiring. And, and we we're in a culture then of work hard, play hard, work harder, and you will make money and you will progress in that company. And Computer Center was a fantastic uh, platform to do that. And then obviously being part of, of, that process there of when they moved from Radlett to the big shiny facility that was that was Hatfield uh, back then and going from private to public through the flotation just really really interesting times in terms of how the dynamic changed and how the business just absolutely exploded and I just took opportunity there when I was you know fortunately given one and moved to from a, a sales manager in a local office to a sales manager in Manchester as well as Birmingham uh, where I met my wife and then and then got the sales director's job and, and it just snowballed from there and you know in fairness to to John Joslin and Mike uh, Norris Tony Conafy and those guys they were always very clear I think as Computer Centre evolved into a far more service centric yeah company in that period that distribution had probably played its part within its own within within Computer Centre and I knew at that point they would look to probably sell the CCD asset, which they eventually did to Ingrams. And um, rather foolishly, I left Computer Centre after 11 or so years, as you say. I left without a job. Um, really? I know, I know. And I had a small I had a small child now. I don't know what I was thinking. But I left because I think when you're part of something you build and you know that's going to move on, at that point for me, it was such a, a personal thing. Um, to see something you build begin to change um, and, and ultimately then get acquired that that I kind of moved on and, and that then started my my second stint with with the Rigby family at, at SCH when I did some work for SCC um, and that was back in 2006 ish I think that was yeah if memory serves you well but but a great experience at centre I mean I cannot speak highly enough about that organisation. And a lot of the people that I knew are still there. They've done so well. They promote from within, which is a fantastic thing to see. Um, you know, good friends with Neil Muller, who was, who was there for many, many years. Oh, and, and, you know, Neil was a sales support when I was there. And, you know, yeah, you look to the that. level. It, yeah, but that's what I mean. That was the culture of the company. If you really, really get stuck in and you value what you do for your organization, your vendors and your customers, then then you'll do well. And, and I think they're still like that. I know people there and yeah, re really great company. Yeah, because they, I spoke to Mike before and they, one of my first, well, my first ever placement was at Metrology. Back wow. In the, yeah. Wow. Now, well, there we go. Yeah, CCD yeah. acquired Metrology. Yeah, they did. Yeah. And I mentioned right, that We did, yeah. We did, yeah. I mentioned that to Mike because... Uh, Ross Baker is now, I think he's the VP of Trend now. He he was yep. a, a, a little team leader in those days. And uh, crazy, he, isn't it? He was he was offering basics of eight k plus commission of an OT of eleven k. And so when I tell yeah. when I tell the, the team here, they're like, "Nah, that never happened." It's like it did. The, OT, it did. the OTE was eleven and a half thousand pounds, yeah. and they actually yeah. hired people. So uh, uh, yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah, <laughs> probably less of a recruitment challenge than there is now. Actually, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so. Let's just talk about actually. You, you talked about there about people sort of working hard and you know Neil Muller's sales support. Yeah, that's the top level. Slightly, slightly digressing at the moment. If you're trying to work hard at the moment and trying to get on in, in distribution or reseller or in, in the channel in general, how do you think you can do that now? Because I don't see many people now getting opportunities. If so, if they are in sales support, yeah. They, they don't seem to progress that quickly. But and, but when we're talking about like yourself or Neil Muller or people and and Computer Center are a very good advocate of promoting within, there seems to be a, a quick fix scenario in the channel at the moment. It's almost like, actually, let's bring this person in and they're going to fix it. How, how, would, how would you advise someone who wants to sort of emulate what you've done or emulate what Neil Muller's done, get into sales support and, and, and progress to career? How can they get on now? 
Yeah, Neil's emulate Neil. He's been more successful than me, so <laughs> um, and others. Um, and and I think I think it's a great question. I, I think the world has changed somewhat. To be fair, I, I consider myself incredibly lucky to have gone through yeah. the 1990s and early 2000s in, in this channel because um, I think opportunities were plenty. It was an industry that was was growing, you know, like this. It was very. We had some dips, obviously. We had some difficult times, but. I think I think we're all a little bit guilty in today's society of instant gratification. And I think people in their careers are, are somewhat tainted by that as well. And I'm conscious, Mark, here of making huge sweeping generalizations, right? There are clearly exceptions everywhere. But I think for me, with patience and loyalty in an organization, opportunity will come. And I think opportunity will come to those people who let it be known that they have that desire, that they have that patience and they have that loyalty to go on and move and move forward. I think one of the hardest things, and, and I have it even today, is when people look to their line manager or their sales director or their MD or even HR with a, what am I going to do next? You know, it, it, it's got to be a two-way conversation, right? Yeah. What does that individual want to do next? They may well have joined in a sales support role, but actually is their future in finance or purchasing or marketing or something else. And you really need people to kind of put themselves forward and let it be known that they are interested, that they're available. And I think the one thing that helped me an awful lot is I never really said no to anything. You know, if, if there was an opportunity, yeah, I'll give it a go. And, and yeah. I think if you do that with a good heart and, and the person who's giving you that opportunity knows you're going to run at it really hard, then you're probably going to be okay. You know, even if you make mistakes, even if you're not quite the finished article, you're, you, you're probably going to do okay. And I think, you know, for me, it was always, even when I was in sales, if I was the guy who was, I don't know, fifth out of 10 in, in the sales league table, right? It was always about, well, how do I get to four, not how do I get to one? Yeah. And it was all about how you take those steps. And sometimes it was about, you know what, salespeople, number one and two, were moving on to, to bigger and better things, maybe inside the company. And these whole set of really blue chip accounts was about to come downstream. So guess what? For the six months ahead of that, I was the secondary contact for those accounts. So when, when they became available, yeah, it kind of becomes a natural choice, providing I've, I've done okay, obviously. But And I think people have this view of, I've done a year, I've done 18 months, what's next? Yeah. I've come in on 20K, I need to earn 30, what's next? And, and I think the pace of the IT channel and the shortage of talent is probably driving some of that behavior more than ever at the moment. But I think, you know, be engaged and don't expect an employer, in my view, uh, be that the company, the HR organization or your line manager to do everything in terms of your career. You're in charge of your career. Um, and the amount of times I, I've had people say to me, wow, you know, I, I wish I knew that opportunity. I, you know, I really wanted to go and do that. And I'm like, my God, I've known you for three years and you've never once. It. Yeah intimated to me that that you know marketing would be a direction you wanted to go in or external sales or whatever it is that you want to do so i think you know in a very in a long-winded way i think having patience earning your stripes all of those very values i think still have a place um yeah and i think for me if if you put yourself forward and, and you're the right sort of person with the right attitude you know the channel's still a fantastic place to build a career but it's, in, it's interesting what you say there, um, Lee, because, for instance, Callum in my, my own company um, yes. you know, started as a grad, did, was a recruiter for a year, team leader, sales manager, sales director, MD. And when I look at him, what, what, how he got that, it's exactly what he said. He was patient, but he, he wanted the responsibility. So yeah. he'd ask me, he said, oh, what, you know, what have I got to do to get an, this job? It wasn't about money. It was about responsibility. And he'd take on responsibility all the time, all the time. So in the end, it was like, and quite frankly, Lee, I want to shift responsibility. I don't want to do anything. So I'm like, I'm like, great, fantastic. You know, you, you do that. And I think it's really important to give people opportunities throughout the channel that aren't ready for it. That it's just like, do you know what? Oh, we're going to promote him to an external. Oh, well, he's only done an internal. He hasn't done client facing. Yeah. 
when is he going to get a bloody chance? Or they, this person. You know, and let's be clear, you're never ready, right? No, you're never, no, of course you're not. You're right. never ready. You're never ready to sit that exam. You're never ready to be a parent. You're never ready to, you know, whatever it is, you're never completely ready. You know, doing the job, you know, the on the job training is everything. And and that culture of of wanting more, you know, James, my my eldest son, he's 19. He's just, well, say just before Christmas started in the world of work. Uh, a really good cricketer, didn't didn't quite make the level he wanted to be, and couldn't go touring because of COVID. And I was like, right, come on, you've got to get into the world of work now. And he started, and and he's doing relentless amounts of calling, scripts, real tough, tough selling. And I just said, but it's a great grounding, and the company that are giving you the opportunity, what they want to see from you is some payback for the opportunity they've given you. It's not about what you want next yet. Yeah. It's about earning your stripes, getting in, keeping your head down. And, you know, for me, I said to him, it's nothing to do with the channel, by the way, or IT. You know, I said, it's important you go and do your own thing. If you end up in IT, fine, but it's important yeah. you start somewhere. And I think what you said there about Callum, it's about, it's about moving people who want to be moved yeah. as well and giving them the opportunity and, and talking to them. I look at Gordon, my sales director at Nuvius was a salesman when I started with Nuvia seven years ago, done lots of different jobs, both locally and internationally. You know, he said to me, am I ready? I'm like, no, of course you're not ready, but you're ready enough. Yeah. And, and he's absolutely fantastic. He's pulling up trees. He's got a great relationship with his team, really good customer guy. And, you know, from that perspective, and then obviously what comes behind him, the next role happens for somebody else. Yeah. Promoting from within for me, like you've done there is, is massively important. And, you know, for me at Nuvius, do I want to make sure that we, we've got career opportunities for the people that are already here ahead of completely net new people? Yes. Do you want new blood? Yes. You've yes. got to get the balance right. But I think giving people the opportunity that want it, deserve it, and have shown that loyalty and shown that desire to take on responsibility, I think it's important. But communication is a massive part of that. You've got to tell them. You want it now, but that job doesn't exist for you now. It's a year away, it's six months away. And I think as long as you give people the information for them to make an adult decision, right, to say, right, I'm going to stay at Nuvius or I'm going to move on to a vendor or I'm going to stay at a reseller rather than move back to district. You know, whatever it is, as long as you've given them the communication that says you have a career path here, it looks like this, and this is roughly the timeline. Because you and I both know, you know, Anything can happen to anybody at any point in time, and therefore an opportunity might come out of nowhere. Absolutely. Or, or, or you might have to wait the full year, two years for that opportunity to land. And, and I think that's all to do with the individual and, and how they feel about what they want to do next. With regards to sort of the talent shortage, you know, and I do think you're right, you know, in, in making people get promoted internally and give them opportunities, it's a two way thing. You know, they've got to be asking for the opportunity and you've got to hopefully yeah. try and present it. So, and it is a balance because you do need fresh blood in, of course. Yeah. What's your view now on, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to say something that's probably not going to be uh, popular for the channel, but I see a lot now and recruiters like me trying to seduce talent that isn't ready from maybe distribution or partners or vendors, or whatever it is, because there's so many high paid jobs now in big vendors. So example, when I hear, oh, I've got, and I hear, obviously I hear from the, the team, oh, we've got an SDR role, Mark, for XYZ company, 50K basic, OT 90K. I'm like, 90,000 pounds for someone that's done a year or 18 months or two years in dish. The world's gone mad. And, and it's not helping the channel and companies no, at all not. because I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, <clears throat> don't get me wrong, if, if the money's out there, of course, I'm saying go for it. But what's your view on this? Because it, 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 I don't know how sustainable it is because if we're getting now an SDR that can earn 70, 80, 90, and we're getting VPs of that company earning three, four, five, six hundred thousand pounds, how can, how can a distributor cope with actually keeping talent for any period of time, because they're they're the, they're almost like the first ones to sort of think, actually, let's just go and get from distribution. How how how, did that, how do you handle it? How do you how do you... It, 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 I'm I'm not sure anybody really handles it well, to be honest. Right. I, I think we handle it the best the best that we can, and 
And I think it's a great question because I've, uh, I think if you were to look at a, an Olympic podium, right, in the channel, the perception was always, I'm not sure it's true to be honest, but let's just say it still is. Distribution was bronze, resellers were silver, vendors were gold. Yeah. And, and that was people's kind of career path, you know, distribution. And I even said it in the open statement, right? It was a great grounding. And yeah. I believe it still is. I think what distribution do for, for vendors and partners now is far broader than it ever used to be. And, and it continues to be. And therefore, the depth of what distribution can offer, I think, is, <clears throat> is, is different, which gives it more longevity in a career uh, than perhaps it used to. I think to, to, to try and answer the question directly, I was talking to, um, I was talking to a competitor over lunch, actually, not, not long ago. Um, and, and we were just having a good chat about recruitment and channel and, and how is it? And we were talking about, you know what, we should go and set up our own business. We should go and set up our own business, you know, and, and I know academy is a common word, but, you know, Channel Academy Limited, because actually what we should arrange with the top 20 vendors in Europe is to say, right, distribution will be the recruitment pool for your next SEs, your next salespeople, and we will keep them for three years. Then you take them on. Yeah. You fund it. And you fund it. You know, maybe we need to partner with a, a, a credible recruitment partner. Yeah. And, 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 and no one, uh, you know, anyway, it, it, we'll, we'll it's what it said. And do that because, because actually that's what's happening anyway. It's just yeah. not formalized. I think one of the things that, that concerns me is, look, if somebody feels they can go and double their salary, no amount of free food Friday, exercise class Tuesday is going to keep somebody if it means yeah. they can you know move their family from the one bed flat to the three bed semi with a garden for their for their child do you know what I mean nothing's no. going to stop that happening and, and it shouldn't you know people people deserve to move on and better themselves I think the hard thing is is the value that's been taken out of the channel yeah by the people that represent some of the vendors so if you've got a really 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 good couple of people on vendor x in the channel, spreading the word for that vendor. And you take that person to that vendor, which typically is what happens. Yeah, as yeah. Yeah, yeah. You've taken a huge amount of amplification about what that vendor does out of the channel. It, it's kind of a strange thing to do in many ways. Yeah. But it is, I think it's seen by the candidate. I think it's seen by the vendor or the reseller as, as the natural progression. Yeah. And, and, you know, who am I to say that's wrong? It's been the way for a long time, and I think it still will be. Sustainability of salaries, you know, distribution can't afford that. You know, I, I don't care who you are, whether you're Nuvius or somebody else. You know, distribution's margin model and, and, and contribution model cannot support that amount of salary growth in, that, in, the, in the amount of time that we've seen it. Uh, and there might be specialist roles that you want to hang on to that you will pay more than top dollar for, but you certainly can't do that generically. And, and I worry, in, in fairness, because everything in life is cyclical, right? I think we all know that. I worry about those people who are going for 90K salaries after two and a half years' experience. Because if things downturn or if things become difficult, they're going to have had to do a fantastic job in reseller x vendor x or even dist x sometimes for that to for that to really stick for them or are they going to be the first people that vendor looks at and says you're out mm. wow yeah. you know you're 26 you've not got that much experience it's quite a lot of money for you know i don't know maybe they will maybe they won't um but i think what's interesting and, and obviously you, you you'd need to ask the guys at, at arrow and exclusive and, and and alex at west coast and and, and what have you we, we tend not to lose our people to other distributors. Right. It happens, but it's rare. I, I would say for every 10 we lose, half a person goes to distrib another distributor, Yeah, largely. And, and technically, and normally that's for the next step up, which, which we perhaps can't afford, uh, uh, can't have a vacancy to give them. But, you know, it says that it, that they're going to reseller and they're going to vendor because the margin availability and therefore the salary availability for them is, is great. And I think the only thing we can do as distributors is continue to bring in this college leavers, the apprentices, the A-level leavers, the, the grads, and really train them up as quickly as we can and try and build in 
some long-term incentives for them, some perhaps career vision and salary vision for three years, and probably accept that we may not have them for more than that two, three-year period. Um, and if we hire 10, you know, maybe maybe two of them are still there in 10 years' time, but the other eight have moved on. And, and, and I think we have to be quite pragmatic in our approach to say, if we can train and, and deliver value to the channel and do a good job for our own business, then we should, knowing that they're going to move on. But it, it, it's tough for distributors. It really is. Do you, it's hard to accept that, though, isn't it? I'm going to train this person. They're going to be great, knowing that they're going to probably be taken by a vendor in two years' time, thinking, I'm, I've wasted my time. Do you have it where, because I, I used to sort of see it where the, the vendor would have an agreement with distribution where they couldn't take it. But if I'm... If I'm the, say it's Checkpoint, if I'm the Checkpoint account manager, I'm putting that message out into the reseller community and I'm working for a distributor, shouldn't the Checkpoint hierarchy say, look, we can't take that that Checkpoint specialist from that distributor. One, it will penalise the distributor. Even if they want to go, it's almost like there they, they should be some sort of cut off where they can't, if they want to go to another vendor, that, that's difficult. But to actually penalise your own messaging at your distributor, you're penalising the distributor, you're penalising your messaging, but you're getting, oh, someone at those checkpoint and they're going to work for it. It just seems broken. And, and I thought there was some sort of agreement between the vendor and distributor where they can't do that. I mean, you know, I think I think there's three, there's probably three responses to that, Mark. And, and there's the human factor. Look, if somebody wants to leave, they want to leave, right? And, and, and you know... A bit like in sport, no, nobody wants uh, nobody wants somebody who's unhappy in the dressing room, right? If you feel they're trying, you're trying to prevent them from going somewhere else. The second point, which I would argue with the vendor with, but kind of end up agreeing with them, is if if we're a checkpoint distributor and we lose one of our checkpoint guys, the checkpoint is that better than losing them to a vendor we don't carry? It probably is, yeah, because at least you're kind of keeping it in the family. Yeah. I think the third point is those agreements still do exist. Um, certainly with us, that there, there's kind of this, some of it is more of an unwritten rule that it's not something you should do, but it's turned more into, if you do do it, this is really the process you should go through. And, 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 and you, you kind of sense there's a, there's a level of, if we don't talk about it, it hasn't happened. You kind of get a bit of a sense of, well, that person wanted to move on. Well, maybe they did, but unless you picked up the phone and and disrupted them with with another, and this wasn't a particularly senior job, to be fair, Mark, right? But if, if you're doubling their salary and disrupting them, we're probably not going to keep them, are we? Yeah. You know, it, 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 it's very easy to throw your hands up and say, well, they wanted to join. Well, yeah, because you've created an environment where, of course, they're going to want to join. And, and, and we have to accept that. I think, you know, for me, we started on, on my career and how many people we all know and how interconnected this, this channel still is. It's definitely not worth falling out with people, right, in this channel because it's too small. Yeah, <laughs> um, it is, yeah. But I think morally, well, then, well, I think morally you know, th th there, is, there is at times, and I don't just mean this in, in, in recruitment, I think there's a, there's a lack of, I think sometimes a lack of transparency in, you know, on social media and on contracts, you know, we all use the word partnership, you know, until <laughs> we're blue in the face. But, you know, perhaps living that word would sometimes be better than just saying it. I, yeah, say I, 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 I love that. It's a, you know, we are a trusted advisor. Well, I don't know if you're that trusted because you're taking people out of us. <laughs> it's like, it's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real difficult it, it, yeah, But But do but you know what? It, it, it is... It, to, to give any company that's moving resource around at the moment, which, by the way, I think we're all we're all guilty of from, from at one stage or another. There are that few people available right now. Yeah, and you see this, Mark. You, yeah. You're at the you're at the sharpest sharp end of this, right? You kind of can't blame people's behaviour for trying to just. No. There's a warm body. They're pretty good. We know they're reliable. Sold. Done. Yeah. You know, and, and and they're rushing to fix their own problem. And and I don't think you can necessarily blame people for behaving that way. I think in retrospect, you would want people to be a bit more considered in, in how they behave towards you if you are a an alliance partner. But 
you know, I, I don't think anybody can have a moral high ground and say they've not done it or they're not doing it. So I, I think it is a nature of where we are at the moment. But the salaries, I think, are, you know, short of putting prices up to everybody from from distribution to reseller, reseller through vendor into the end user, I, it, it's unsustainable. Yeah, I think it's unsustainable. It to, to establish yourself now, let, we touched on LinkedIn, you mentioned there. To establish yourself now as a sales professional or a, a, a professional, whatever you want to do, what's your view on LinkedIn now as a, as a communication tool? Because I'm seeing, and I'm, I'm, put, I'm going to put, put myself in the, the shop window to be shot down. The posts that go out now and around whether it's International Women's Day or Ukraine or we're doing this charity and we're fabulous and we're that and the other, et cetera, et cetera. I'm seeing it is really, really difficult to work out what the company stands for and what the company are anyway, because everyone now, when I'm looking at a, a company to recruit for them, you know, they've got this charity, they're perfect and, you know, they're, they're celebrating diversity and they're, due, they're doing this charity and they're, they're doing X, Y, Z. And then I, I know some people that work there and it's just not true. It's just not true. It just doesn't happen behind the scenes. So what's your view on, on, on trying to establish yourself on LinkedIn? Because, you know, an example would be as well, you know, as a, as a salesperson, if I want to get through to someone, and I say to these people and recruiters when they when they join you, I said, look, this is a pride swallowing, knee groveling job. No one wants to speak to you. Um, you um, are unknown. Um, you've got the credibility of a goldfish, quite frankly. Um, and the decision makers will look at your profile and think, well, you were doing nothing last year. So what do you know? So how would you now establish yourself? And luckily, I'm older. I don't have to go through this stuff because I think it's quite hard to establish yourself. But just sending out messages on LinkedIn and hoping, hi, Lee, I'm doing this. You know, do you want to speak to me about X? It's not really going to work anymore because I, I, I don't know what to trust when I look on LinkedIn now. And before I, I was I was looking for sort of transparency and I'm thinking I like that I could look into the company. I think, oh, actually, you know, whether it's um, a video around their office, et cetera. But if everyone's putting up, we're doing this for charity. If everyone's putting up, we're celebrating International Women's Day. If everyone's putting up, we are the best company. We've got pool tables, this and the other. I, I don't know how to break through that noise myself because it's almost like it's very difficult. Because when I get messages, Lee, I, I normally get someone and re resellers um, sending me messages. And, and I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. And I won't, I won't name the company. I got a message from... Oh, go on. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. He'll, he'll kill me, but he'll, he'll know it. I got a message from a salesperson at a reseller um, saying, uh, oh, I love your, your channel chat, great, um, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you could do some recruitment for us. I was like, oh, great. And then what happened was the, I didn't respond straight away. And he, he, he called in for me and um, he's like, he, and I never spoke to him. And he emailed me back saying, God, I was trying to do you a favor. I don't need your business. I was just trying to do something for you. And I was like, dude, like, what are you talking about? I, I haven't spoken to you. I've got a, I, I use a couple of resellers for, for um, laptops, kit, you know, services, that sort of hey. stuff. I would have spoken to him. Now, ironically, and it will narrow it down now, I knew the, the CEO. I knew the, the owner of the, of the business. So and I wasn't trying to cause problems. So I forwarded the email to, to, to the, the CEO. I said, I won't say his name. Hi, Joe. Look, I've got an approach from one of your sales guys. Probably in the last 20 years, I've never seen something so poor because he's now slagging me off because I didn't respond quick enough. I just thought you should know. I, 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 and I wasn't trying to get the guy sacked or anything like that. I just thought, but... Uh, I, I was absolutely astounded at his approach. So basically, if I don't respond to him because he sent some message on LinkedIn, and I will swear, I, I'm an arsehole. I'm like, I wasn't, I don't, and do you know what, Lee? I would have responded. I was actually in a meeting for the afternoon. I would have responded by the end of the day, but because I didn't do it quick enough, I was in trouble. And I thought, this is it. This is crazy. Now, when I'm getting messages from unknown people, I, I'm not responding to everybody. I'm getting random messages trying to sell me lead gen, HR software, CRM, things, technical things. Loads of irrelevant stuff. How does a salesperson now establish themselves with some sort of credibility 
and get hold of Lee and think, do you know what? I'm not going to make a complete tool of myself by just sending a message saying, hi, Lee, I can help your pain. And all these bloody buzz buzzwords. I can help your pain points. And we need to have a Zoom meeting to discuss. I don't want to discuss it with you. I'm not interested in discussing. I don't know what. I don't even know my bloody pain points, let alone you do it. How do people establish themselves with some sort of credibility when, quite frankly, <clears throat> they don't even know what they're doing themselves and they're approaching people like yourself with no credibility and no idea what you're doing? Yeah. I, I think... I think I was I was one of the first people in channel on LinkedIn ages ago, right? Somebody who I worked at Computer Center said you should use this tool years ago. And I actually came off it for a couple of years. I've only been back on about six months for the some of the reasons you've you've articulated. Um, but I've kind of come back on because I feel I have to, if I'm honest. So we'll Why? come back to LinkedIn. Why do you have to? Well, I'll come back to that in a minute yeah. in, a, in a little bit. Um I think you, you did a you did a session with with Stephen Bartlett, right? Yeah. Who who's a young man, who has been incredibly successful, and I think one of the things for me in establishing yourself as an individual in any company in any industry, in my opinion, and again, a bit old school perhaps. You know, Stephen talks about the you know the it's the little things that make the difference. It's the little things that matter, and I think that's the same for for me, right? I think if you look at situations in a company, if you're transparent, if you care about other people, if you're doing the right things, if you listen and learn, if you partner with somebody in your organization who's been there, done that, understands the hurdles, can perhaps give you some advice, be somebody who other people want to help, right? Be a personality that draws attention, positive attention to yourself by being a good person. And I think there's a lack of that because in my opinion, there are no shortcuts. Mm. And in an instant gratification world, as, as I said, you know, people expect an answer in three minutes. People expect to be successful after six months, 12 months in their first job. And it's the unknowns. It's the little things that Stephen talks about that matter. Tell, tell you a story, with, just to digress slightly on recruitment. It wasn't at Nuvius. It was just before I'd, I'd left Nuvius. We um, we were hiring a couple of, of salespeople, telesalespeople, not quite externals yet, but probably second jobbers, right? And I went and grabbed a sandwich before a 2 p.m. interview. It was about 20 to 2, half past one, 20 to 2. Walked in the sandwich shop, about three in the queue. There's an older lady at the front, but the young lad in the middle, and me, me at the back. And this, I think this lady either dropped a bag or dropped a purse or something. And this guy's... This guy who was in front of me scuttled around the sandwich shop, picking up all the coins and all that. Just a really nice guy. And she said, oh, what a lovely man you are. And he goes, no, don't, don't be daft. And, you know, it's the least I can. It was just a really nice bloke and really polite to the, the lady who served him. And lo and behold, in 20 minutes' time, that was the guy who was in reception waiting for me for his interview. Brilliant, yeah. He, he already had the job when I saw him because he was just a, a good guy, right? I knew my team would want him to be successful. So they would help him be successful by these are the hurdles these are the objections these are the things that you're going to have by all means use social media but don't only use social media and ultimately guess what we're a channel of connections yeah so if you're a new starter coming into the the world of it earn your stripes learn your trade create some inherent value in yourself because then you'll be valuable to somebody else don't expect people to give you what you think you deserve, right? Go and earn it. Go and earn it and, and then allow people to nurture you and develop you. So the best th the best advice I could give anybody is know how to get things done inside your own company. Because you can be the best salesman in the world. Sorry, salesperson in the world. Yeah? yeah? You'd be the best salesperson in the world. But if you can't affect your commitment to the customer back at your own company, you're just going to leave a trail of destruction behind you. So be connected internally. Make sure the guy in purchasing wants to help you. Make sure the guy who looks after credit lines wants to help you. Sell. Permanently sell yourself to, to your teammates. And, and the second piece I would say is that if you're sat with somebody who's been through it, Mark, and has had the bad days, and by mm. the way, that's another point. Don't expect every day to be a good day. Deal with it. 
right? Yeah. You're going to get, get rejection. Yeah. You're going to get, yeah, deal with it. Not everything is sunshine and roses every day. You're going to have to put up with some people who put the phone down on you, people who promise you all sorts and then don't come back to you. But allow the people you've connected with internally to help you make and join their external connections. So guess what? If that CEO that you talked about at the reseller had, and, and had a connection with, with that internal salesperson who was trying to get in touch with you, perhaps if you'd have got, hey, Mark, John Smith's just joined us. Can you give him 10 minutes of your time? Because I'd use LinkedIn and say, oh, my CEO knows Mark Sumner really well by the looks of this been connected for years been in the same company i'm going to go and drop him a one-line email or knock on his door even better go and talk to somebody yeah and say i want to try and get in get into into uh, robson sumner i know you know them any chance you can just make me a quick intro 30 Lee. second job Lee. and do, do you know what lee as well what's ironic was it's not that I have, I have, it's not that I avoid it. No, 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 no. I, 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 I try not to as well. I'm the, I'm the easiest person to get through. I'll take anyone's call. So I, I was, I was, it was just shock. I was just, I'm just amazed at now um, sales approaches because you mentioned Stephen Bartlett and, you know, he graciously came on the show in during the COVID. Yeah. And, and how I got him was I saw one of his posts, I sent him a video and I just caught him at the right time. I literally said, like to post, et cetera. I think it'd be great for the challenge for you to come on, share your pearls of wisdom on social media. Do you know what? My, he emailed back, like your approach, Mark, sent it out with my PA, which was great. And it, and it, and it was genuine because um, one of the reasons I, I, we, we set up the channel chat, it wasn't for, um, I can't, anyone that knows me, I'm not trying to be this worthy person. I'm not trying, I'm not, I'm not that. I wanted to give it a voice that ch issues were honestly spoken about with no, per, you know, with no sort of persecution. So for example, I've done a women in tech series on the channel chat. Am I this massive advocate about women? I, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not against it. I, I don't understand. I'm not, but I'm happily, happily, and I'm going to do a channel chat live um, event around it, and I'll happily um, facilitate it because I want to know more and I want to be educated myself. I don't want to be persecuted for not understanding it enough, thinking, oh, well, Mark, you didn't put out um, a banner around women in technology. It's like, Sorry, I, I, I think I think it I think it is I think it is I think it is terribly difficult, right? So so for me, you will rarely see me post anything on, on, on social media. So privately I'm not on social media. Okay. Right. So I'm on LinkedIn. You'll rarely see me post anything. I might do a, a Nuvius article or something with one of our core vendors like a Juniper or a WatchGuard. Yeah, I might do something like that. But fundamentally it goes back to, to what Stephen Bartlett said. I think being humble and being transparent, I think I can affect more change, positive change, for a, a subject you just touched on, say women in technology, by providing opportunity for the women that work at Nuvius to promote through the ranks yeah. and do different things than me making a, having a picture taken like this or, or, or making a statement on social. I, I personally think that's my that's my style and my preference, yeah? yeah? That I would rather know that I've enabled or helped or supported somebody get from A to B to C in their career because they deserve it, rather than try and prove to everybody I'm connected with on LinkedIn and beyond that I'm very, you know, pro this or very aware. I, I, my personal view is actions speak louder than words, right? And I think yeah. it's very, very easy for people's PR, should we say, people's self PR, because that's what this is now. And I think, yeah. you know, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff I see on LinkedIn is 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 about, you know, oh my God, the whole the whole of the channel said something about Ukraine. I haven't said anything yet. I better post a Ukrainian flag next to our company banner. I'm again, I would rather be associated with something more discreet. I would rather be associated with sponsoring somebody or helping with their travel or yeah. you know, wh whether it's one of these putting people up for a period. You know, I'd rather be associated with that and know that those nearest and dearest to me understand that my heart's in the right place and I'm trying to make an actual difference, yeah, not a PR difference. 
Right. And there's and there's a lot of worthiness out there about it, isn't it? It's like so, for instance, you know, like. But I think some of that's my age as well, by the way. You know, I'm, you're, I think you're very I'm elderly, sure, aren't you? Yeah, I'm, old. <laughs> I'm fifty this year, mate, and I'm feeling every bit of it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, no, but you literally find yourself in this situation of, you know, if if you can do the right things and behave in the right way, you're going to influence and affect people in a positive way. Yeah, and we don't always do it. Sometimes we do things that affect people badly that we don't really understand the impact of. And that's a learning exercise that you never stop. I don't yeah, think. that's hard, isn't it? Because sometimes that's you're actually really hard. You don't you, you you might think it's not affecting people and it is, you know. I, I have oh, like, completely in my own company, you, you know. Um completely. You know, you're the boss, you're the boss, Mark. You say something, people are, oh God, you know, for you it was enough that's covering mark, perhaps. And it, you have got to be careful, and I'm not always the best at that. And and I think, you know, I try and be quite self-deprecating with the people at Nuvius. You know, I'm happy to be like, God, hi guys, I'm not really good at this. Do you know what I mean? So try and put other people at ease because they know you're not perfect and you're not the finished article either. And I, and I think the social media, media age of, of trying to present this perfect facade of your life, of your career, of what your company does. You know, I, I think there's a world of difference between being socially conscious and actively trying to do the right things rather than just having a fantastic marketing engine that yeah. relentlessly posts and posts and posts and posts and posts about the worthiness of whatever particular international day or, or conflict in the world or whatever it is that, that, that you're doing. And you know, I know Mark, I know you ran the marathon for charity, Mark, right? And I know that's great. And those who know you would want to sponsor you and look after you. But I know you didn't splash it everywhere because it's something you wanted to do, right? Yeah. And and it, you don't you don't see that you wanted to do it needing to be everybody else's, you know, everybody's got to be aware of what Mark's doing, right? And and I think there's a bit of there's a lack of transparency and a, there's there's a massive lack of people being humble, I think. Yeah. Humble's good. Helping people, the, tr the true mark of, of, of a good human being, in my opinion, is that when you help somebody and you're not expecting anything in return, you do it. whether that's a pat on the back or a thumbs up on LinkedIn or a like on Instagram or whatever it is, it's because you're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And I do think we're absolutely in a, in a, in a maelstrom of relentless messaging of aren't we great, aren't we great, aren't we great, come and work here, look at us, we've got a table tennis table, come and do this, come and do this. Well, well do you know what? Just because you've got a table tennis table doesn't make you a great company to work for. No. You might be, by the way. But, you know, for as many people that have had a great experience with you, you, you talk to people who've worked for me over the years, some are going to think I'm an idiot because they perhaps had a bad experience, didn't get their pay rise, we had to make redundancies, I don't know. You speak to other people, Oh, Lee was great. He really support, and that's normal, isn't it? Not everybody's going to like you. Not everybody's going to agree with the decision you've got to make. But I think this desire for everybody to have a facade of everything's perfect and everything's wonderful, I actually think makes things harder for people. I don't think it makes it better and easier. We hope you're enjoying this episode of the Channel Chat podcast. And now, a few words from our sponsor. Channel Chat is brought to you by Convergent Technology. The Convergent team is made up of experienced and innovative IT professionals. Our mission is to disrupt the traditional reseller market and we want the most aspirational salespeople to join our team as part of our journey. We know IT sales has a bad rep, so we've created a rewarding culture with the best remuneration and career progression in the industry. Check out convergenttechnology.com for more info. How, how do you deal with that as a leader, Lee? So, if, for example, I said, Oh, I wouldn't say this, by the way. But if I said, oh, I've spoken to four, four or five candidates. They might. They, yeah, they might. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't tell you now. But if I spoke to four or five candidates, it's like, oh, yeah, Lee's a terrible boss. He's this, he's that, the other. He didn't do this, he didn't do that. D does that bother you? So for me, it, it, the feedback would, actually. I, I, it, I, I'm yeah, of course, yeah. I'd be like thinking, oh, no, they don't like me now. And mm, what should I do? Does it, as a leader, does that bother you, feedback? That, or even if you don't get feedback, you're... you're you're being sort of talked about that negatively. Yeah, I think we all want to be liked, don't we? We we all want to think we're we're available. We all we, we all want to think we've treated people as we want to be treated. We all think we've tried to do the right thing by people. 
uh, yeah, it would bother me. I think I think anybody who says I don't care would would perhaps have a tinge of mistrust from me there because yeah. I think we all read. I think I think we all care. I, I think context is important. You know, I think forever. You know, you talk about social media or or, or you, even the news, even main TV news now. You know, I've I've seen people absolutely ridiculed in the media for a statement that they've made, which has taken completely out of context. Or, and I think this blame, it's not me, it's somebody else's fault that we live in today. You know, I'm great, it's because they haven't done a good job for me. You know, I didn't get promoted because company X are not very good. You know, I didn't get promoted by Lee because he's not one of my favorites. Well, guess what? When people say to me, have you got favorites, Lee? Yeah, of course I have. Yeah. A stupid bloody question. You're human. Of course you have. You got yeah. Of course I've got friends. The, the people I get on with, the people I've got stuff in common. Guess what? The people who work really hard, do the yeah. right thing, constantly do the right thing, don't bring loads of problems to my door every two minutes. Of course I like them because I value the impact that they have, not only on the company I represent, but on my day as well. And, yeah. and, and I think that's human nature. And, and I think, you know, it's very, very... I think it's very, very hard for people today. And I'm very lucky, closing in on 50, very lucky that I came through at a period where the pace was somewhat slower. I don't mean the pace of making calls and trying to do deals, but the pace of the pace of building your your credibility, your reputation. You were allowed to do it more slowly. I think, you know, people recruit people now and want them to be have instant impact and, and you know it's like football clubs right spend 50 million pound on a player and they've got to score three goals in the first two games or else it's a disastrous signing i mean it's crazy you know this that the pressure we put on ourselves and each other i think at the moment is is probably at its peak as it, that it's ever been yeah. because the media spotlight is is on everything and and you know I, I feel really sorry for anybody that's in the spotlight who feels obliged to, to augment their personality because of the PR that they have to they have to give to their their audience, be that on TV, be that in sport, be that whatever. Yeah. Um, so, so I think it's a really tough for young people. I think it's incredibly difficult. You know, mm. I, I've heard people call my son going, "Oh, you didn't like my thing yesterday." What? <laughs> like one of your one of your seventeen posts that you got. You know, I forgot to put one thumbs. Up. I mean, geez, it, 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 it's kind of have a day off. Yeah, you know, yeah. Perhaps spend perhaps spend some time. You know, focusing on the moment a little bit, and you know, I don't want that to sound happy clappy, but you know, be present for a while rather than worrying about what everybody else thinks all of the time. Um, guess what? You know, we all have bad days. We all have bad customer days. We don't all win the, the, the tender, right? We don't all get the job we want. We don't all get promoted. We don't all earn the money we want when we want. That's everybody. Yeah, everybody. of course it is. Everyone, so, everyone. so, so, so be, be open, be transparent. You haven't got to put, are you? Don't publish everything because you don't need to, in my view. But I'll, I'll be happy to say, yeah, I didn't get it. I went for it. Would have been a good step for me. Perhaps I wasn't quite ready. You know, people would hide behind that today. Like, no, no, it just wasn't the right fit. We decided it wasn't the right, you know. Yeah. Why are you putting these words out there? The fact is, there was three people for the job. You didn't get it. Somebody else did, right? Well done for getting to the three, but it just wasn't meant to be. And I, I don't I don't understand where the shame of these sorts of things have materialised from. It's, it's weird, really, because when we, when we give bad news to the... the um. The, the candidates here and the team say to me oh yeah he didn't get it he he did x y as the interview they're not going to they're not going to proceed okay you're going to tell them that well no we'll just say he's got picked at the post where he wasn't quite right although it's considering for next time they don't want to give the bad news because you know if i if i give you to you say lee yeah um unfortunately um they've given the job to joe blogs or jane blogs because um they just thought they were the better candidate and you weren't yeah, good enough. Well, better okay. culture fit you weren't quite yeah. good enough You've, they've got more experience in their fit. Well, whatever. Yeah, that's yeah. life, isn't it? And and but, they, but we always sort of try and soften it. It was like, well, look, it was quite closely, but you know they they'll consider you for next time. It's almost like sometimes people don't like brutal honesty. 
And, and uh, but I think, it, especially if you're going to have growth, that's where the challenging conversations, the growth comes from challenging conversations. Because if it's all nice all the time, no, nothing happens. No, no, the magic doesn't happen. So um, I've got I've got to say, Mark, you know, this this kind of that point you've just raised has kind of come about accidentally. It's probably the hardest thing I find. Really, in, in my career, yeah, the the, the fact that I I probably you know, people's criticism of me. And I, I would arguably say, and a couple of my leaders, you know, Paul Eccleston, uh, who I worked for for many years, has, has kind of said this to me, that, you know, Lee, whilst you've, done a, whilst you've done well in your career, you know, your honesty and perhaps the fact you wear your heart on your sleeve may have held you back a bit. And I understand exactly what he means because people, you know, and Paul, Paul's a bit like that. He was just much better at managing that than me. Right. If I, if I if I if I think I've got something to say, I'll I'll kind of say it. I'll, you know, and I'm not saying it to offend. I'm not saying it to upset. I'm not saying it to be the most you know vocal person in the room. But you know, if five colleagues are about to go into a, a management meeting, right, and we're all having a sandwich and a coffee, and we all agree that actually the MD or the CEO's next step is wrong, and we should all just kind of say, guys, slow down. You know, you can bet a pound to a penny it'll be me that that kind of puts his head above the parapet, and 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 you know that that builds a reputation which, depending on what company you're in or what company you're in, if you see what I mean, yeah, yeah, can can be perceived as a negative thing or a good thing. But I would say more often it's perceived as don't be the person who puts yourself out there. I, I think you know, in and, and I I really disagree with that. You know, if people come to me and say, do you know what, Lee? you've really upset me today because you said this, this, and this, and it's not fair. I'll sit down with them and go, didn't get that. That's not what I meant. Or that is what I meant. And let's have an argument about it or what, you know, whatever. But I'll give people the time. I think, I think this desire to have these, these coffee machine, water cooler conversations, but never have the courage of your convictions to, to take them forward is why we have problems. Yeah. You know, it's people's desire to be perfectly, you know, the company I work for is perfect. My colleagues are perfect. My relationship is perfect. My children are perfect. You know, it's this constant need for everything to be painted in such pretty colours. And, and it's not real. And, and I think people's desire to deal with honesty in the workplace, you know, it, it's just not there. And I think something's got lost in the last 15 years. And, and what I mean by that is, as we all become more sensitive to, to, to race, to religion, to sexism, to, to disability, to all these things, which we need to do, by the way, me more than anybody, you know, you, you kind of go through life thinking, well, I mean it this way, so I'm sure they're not upset. Do you know what I mean? You go through life thinking you're not there trying to, but if you see that, you know, you've got to develop and learn and evolve and actually say, do you know what? bit of re-education for me i need to i need to fast forward my life five years you know the amount of times i hear teenagers say to grandparents right or kids say to parents oh you can't say that mum because they're they, they've been brought up in a different world and that's a good thing right but it doesn't mean to say that adult is a bad person exactly right and that's what we're doing. It's this victimization all the time of you're out of order, you're this, you're that, you're the other. I think it's awful. You know, we, we don't we go through life blaming everybody. And I think it's vital in in careers that we step up and go, do you know what? Yes, I've got more to learn. Yes, my behavior should have been better. But actually, it's re you're responsible for receiving information in the spirit it was intended. Yeah. You know. Everybody's this. Everybody's got this desire to be mortally offended by everything. Maybe the person does disagree with you. You know, we're allowed to disagree, right? Yeah. It's not. It's not yet a criminal offence to disagree with somebody. And and yet, I think in social media, in the work environment, there's no such thing anymore as disagreements or arguments. Yeah. They're they're just opinions that we all need to share and. You know, let's work it out as a partnership. And, and I think that's all good. And I think there's better ways now of conflict resolution than there ever was. And, and you know, companies are to be applauded for that, Mark. But I do think sometimes, you know, I, I know 
at times I'll be very ready to say something <laughs> that, I, that, that I know to be true. Well, perhaps I think it's true. That yeah. I know to be true that people just don't want to hear or they're not ready to hear or they'd rather not hear. And guess what? I'm as guilty as, well, perhaps Lex guilty, but still partly guilty of, of at times keeping my mouth shut when probably I shouldn't and probably mm. other people shouldn't. Because uh, you wouldn't believe when somebody starts that dialogue, when somebody's brave enough to start that dialogue, I bet you end up talking about it for two hours in that group. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas right. otherwise it's just shut down. And I don't think that's healthy. And it, and and like I said, that I think that's where the, the growth happens. It's almost or or you know, it might be breaking. I, you know, uh, you know, it's 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 it's, yeah, it's, like, it's like having a divorce, isn't it? The unsettled rule. If you don't if you don't actually have to talk talk about it, you end up going on for years and just thinking, actually, will it we'll, we'll just drift for five or six years and we'll just drift, yeah. So, exactly. so it's no good. Talking of things um being perceived as perfect, now. Nuvius having mergers and acquisition, lots of companies are going, we're having organic growth, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that's fantastic. Yeah. Mergers is challenging. And I, I wanted to sort of speak to you about um, how it's happened for Nuvius because you've obviously had Siphon, you've had Zyco, you've had Cloud Distribution, you've had Wickhill. That's got to be complicated trying to make that all one 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 piece so how have you got about it so, you know what, what's the sort of lessons you've learned from it I, I think a lot of things i think when you acquire companies or you, or you seek to be on acquisitive path um be that as a reseller or a distributor or, or any other business i guess i think it's very important that you need to i know it sounds obvious but you need to know why you're doing it right are, are you doing this because it's a market share play are you doing this because it's a vendor line card play are you doing this because actually there's a skill set at this company that is going to cost you a huge amount of money to develop and buy in if you do it organically? So an acquisition is the right uh, is the right story. Is it the fact that you've got a set of, of business, uh, you know, core objectives in your business which are relevant, but you need to diversify and you can't really do that with your existing team or portfolio? So I think what why you're doing it is really important because when you're going through an integration or a first meeting or everybody's meeting everybody other staff and vendors you've got to keep that right it's very very and i'm not blaming any company in the world for doing this right it is very 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 easy for an acquiring company to think that they're right <laughs> because they're the acquiring company right we've all done it right we've all done it and we have to go back all the time and remember why it is you acquired them because you must have loved them for a reason, right? So why are you trying to throw that particular baby out of the bathwater? So for me, discipline is really important. Communication, especially internally and, and to partners and vendors is, is important. Guess what? At any level, at any level, whether it's about COVID, whether it's about flexible working, whether it's about job security through an acquisition, if you don't tell people, they'll make their own minds up. And, and most of the time, it won't be positive. Yeah, they, they will imagine the worst. So I think lessons learned from me are, it's never, ever, ever as easy as you hope it will be. <laughs> I don't think anyone thinks it's going to be easy. No, no. It's, 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 it's never, ever, ever, you know, people always talk about a one plus one acquisition equaling two and a half or three. I think that happens, but I don't think it happens in the first year or so. I think you have to settle. I think you have to allow the business that's been acquired to continue to thrive and develop in the way that they have. Uh, if you look at Nuvius with Cloud, you know, that still operates as a completely separate business today under Greg and Adam and the team at Anne of Reading, completely different. Are we... Are we collaborating on certain things in certain accounts where it makes sense or certain vendors? Yeah, of course, we are. It'd be crazy not to. Because what we want to do is kind of crawl before we can walk. And it is crawl before we can walk rather than walk before we can run. Because we want to make sure that you don't lose people on that journey. And, and actually, you know, making sure that your customers and particularly actually in this environment, vendors, our understanding of the reason why the acquisition is taking place, how actually it supports their future aspirations with a cloud distribution or a Nuvius or a Siphon or a whoever, 
And I think making those steps, making those steps very transparent for people is, is very, very important and, and checking in. We have a bit of a strategy at Nuvia Smart, which is not about wham, bam integration. It's not about you've been here six months, same system, one leader, but you know, it's about trying to maintain and continue to extract the value of the of the asset that you've bought. Um, I'm not saying that's completely the right way or completely the wrong way of doing it. Companies have different. We, I think where you've got absolute synergies, same people, same accounts, same vendors, same location, it's different. But you're buying something for the unique talents that they have. So you need to try and, and maintain those talents, whether they're in the people, in the vendor contracts or in the customers. So I think for me, Acquisition is rife. It's going to continue to be rife. Um, I think people, smaller businesses, will continue to get um, to continue to get bought by the bigger guys, whether that's via a private equity engine or whether that's a trade sale. I think that will continue to happen at pace. Um, I think you'll see more and more larger distributors leaving the, the businesses they've acquired to be standalone for a while, or when they are integrated, to continue to have a bit of a different identity you know a lot of the bigger guys you know do this a lot of the bigger guys tend to acquire and integrate and then you've kind of forgotten what you've what you've acquired uh, i think now people are starting to realize well because we've acquired them for that speciality let's let them deliver that speciality for a period of time uh, before we consider what the synergies or, or what the the integration might be um but i think it's it's both parties have to go forward in good faith. You know, there's, there's a lot of a lot of chess, isn't there, when you make an acquisition? People are thinking, well, is my job secure? Is yeah. this really going to be the way it is forever? And I think you've got to be open. I think you've got to be pragmatic. Um, I think it's very, very good when you see senior people. Well, in fact, no, sorry, that's wrong. When you see people from the company that's been acquired, be they senior or not, getting newer bigger different jobs in the combined business i think that's yeah, a really that's good thing to see um and i think you know almost as a in a positive discrimination way i think distributors and perhaps other resellers you know we need to do that we need to make sure that he's a really good guy with technology he could be our next cto or he should be our head of professional services or do you know what there's two sales directors actually that guy's an absolute legend at enterprise customers, but that guy's fantastic at SMB. Well, rather than put it under one, is it better for our customers and vendors that we have two divisions that specialize in those particular areas? And by that, you're bringing the best of, of both together. I think with, with Wickhill and Zyco, it's slightly different because Nuvius, Nuvius was born out of the acquisition of those two people, those two companies. Yeah. And, and because one was very cyber and one was very networking, it was quite, easy for those companies just to carry on. You got to remember Nuvius came with, you know, Rigby private equity money and Paul Eccleston. He didn't come with any other staff. So there wasn't a matter of who's going to do what job. It yeah. was people almost carrying on as business as usual, but, but certainly where you've added things, it's important. And I, and I think when you're acquiring um, in different geographies, you know, the culture's vital. Um, I think in some areas, you know, we've made acquisitions where the company we're acquiring is bigger than our presence in a country. So it's almost yes. felt a bit of a reverse acquisition or a merger. Um, so I think that's good. And, and I think, you know, I, I'm not the finished article at this at all. Um, I try and do sort of quarterly town halls with with all of my teams as one. So they all hear the same message. Um, I, I'm not always as disciplined as I should be on those, candidly. But I think communication is vital with people. You've got you've got to tell them why. You know, we have people all the time saying, "Oh, th there was a strange guy walking around the office with a tape measure the other day. Are we closing an office down?" You know, people's brains just go from there to there. Yeah. And I'm like, no, the landlord's just changed hands and he's just doing a, a rent review. <laughs> but yeah. unless you tell people, right? But unless you tell people, they're going to make their own minds up. And 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 unfortunately, I think. As leaders, just because we know, and we therefore presume other people must think the way we do. And I'm terrible at that at times. You know, I know there's nothing to worry about. So surely you must know there's nothing to worry about. But, you know, sometimes you, you have to be deliberate, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and say, and I think, you know, certainly me as an individual, I need to be better at that. And I think most 
I think some companies are very good at it. Some are quite bad. But I think the channel has grown so quickly. Communication is, is often an art. We're not always. To say that we're a lot of us are sellers and <laughs> customer and vendor people, we're, we're not always the best at, at communicating. Lee, I was going to do a, a quick fire questions on recruitment with you, but we, 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 yeah. we're running out of time and I want to make sure, yeah, sure. that, that I, I want to get this one question in because I asked Neil Burton, um, who's now at Proofpoint, um, yes, yeah. and uh, he gave me, the, he had me in stitches, he did, you know, very comical. Oh, brilliant, thanks. And, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he, I asked him this question and his story was great. And I, I wonder if you've got a story as well. What and you know, have a couple of minutes to think about what what's the funniest thing that's happened to you as a candidate or a hiring manager during an interview? Because Neil, Neil's Neil's story he gave me was, was absolutely brilliant, and I was laughing. And I thought, you know, what? I'm going to start asking the guests now what they think. What, 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 was was he the manager or was he the candidate? He was the he was the manager. I knew and, he would be. I and, knew and, he would and, be. And the candidate emailed him saying, "Hello, darling." But he's trying to email his wife, but he actually emailed Neil. <laughs> so, and then, and then, and then the, the, Neil on the second interview put the put the email up on the screen to to, to show him, and, it, and he did he get the job. But he, Neil's delivery of it was brilliant as well. So uh, he's a good orator as well. But so, what, so no that? pressure at all. Yeah, no pressure. Is there anything funny that's no, happened in, in you know, when when you've had a candidate or or, or during an interview? No, I mean, obviously, it's great that I bumped into that guy in the sandwich shop, the one yeah. that I talked about earlier. I think that was a really nice thing to do. Not funny, but I think yeah. just a cautionary tale for anybody that if you're a good person, you never know who's listening, right? Or seeing yeah. you. So, so doing the right things without expecting payback is a good thing. I think probably when I was a candidate, but it's not really funny. It's actually quite frightening. <laughs> let's hear it then. Let's, let's hear it. Come on. Well, I felt it was quite frightening. I felt it. I won't, I won't mention the company, but it it was it was an interview I was at um, after I'd left Computer Centre, and I was actually interviewed, being interviewed by Paul Eccleston that day. So I had two interviews in the same day, not in the same part of the country. So it was a bit of a bit of a stress. But I went to this first one before I met before I met Paul, and um, this interview was when I say it was in the middle of nowhere literally picture an American werewolf in London, right? Yeah. That, that, you know, it, it was literally out on the moor somewhere. It was in the middle of that. You know, it was one of those ones where I was thinking, I'm not sure I'm going to get out of here alive. So. Yeah. Anyway, it was in an old barn. Lovely, by the way, lovely. But it was in this old barn and I couldn't, believe, I couldn't get in. I'd arrived in, in Canada, but I couldn't get in. There was like buttons and buzzers and nobody was answering and I called the number I got and there was, you know, because actually it would come through a, a, a company like yourselves and they were like, well, it's weird, we can't get older, you know, and I'm like, bloody hell. So anyway, it was, it was, it was May, June time and the summer had started and I finally got in and, it, and, and I, I was, I was there for probably three, four, five minutes late, which I'll, I'll take. The fact that they wouldn't let me in, I think is their fault, but let's just say it's my fault. There was a whole panel of five people and two of them didn't work for the company. They were behavioural scientists. <laughs> By the way, this wasn't a big company, okay? And I sat down and, and, and the chap said, uh, hello, Lee, how are you? You know, didn't get offered a drink, didn't any of that, which I always think it's nice when you move in. How you do? How's your journey? Do you want a drink? You know, yeah, get, yeah. get the candidate comfortable. Come didn't do any of that. Didn't do any of that, but whatever. It didn't, didn't offend me, just thought, fine. And they said, uh, lovely day outside. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you like sailing? And I went, well, I've done, I said, I've done a bit of cow's work. I, you know, took it very genuinely. I've done a bit of cow's work. I wouldn't say I'm a sailor. I don't really know what I'm doing. It really needs to have an engine for me, you know, to worthwhile. And I said, why do you ask? And they said, uh, and they looked at their watch. He looked at his watch, the behavioural guy, and he went, because you obviously like sailing very close to the wind. What? And I'm like, really? interesting start to an interview. But I thought, let it go. You know, he obviously wanted to make the point that we'd, we'd started a few minutes later. We, we, fine, okay, took that. And we went through, and it was a fairly standard interview, and it was going relatively well. You know, lots of nodding and interruptions at the right time and extra questions. And we got towards the end, and I'd kind of forgotten about the sailing close to the wind and not been able to get in the building and seen these two behavioural scientists that they had. And I was a bit like, mm, okay, it's fine. I'm, I'm actually warming up here. I think I'm warming up and I'm, they're warming to me and I'm now warming to them. This is it. <laughs> and then the other person, as the, as the, as, well, it, it turned out to be the last question of the interview because I got up and left. 
in an interview, right? Wow. Which I've never advised anybody to do, by the way, but I did. The other person went, well, okay, we understood about your career, your, your sales technique, your, your leadership style, how you want to, to work with customers and your people and all the rest of it. Um, but a very important thing for us is um, we'd like to know how you choose to discipline your children. What the hell has that got to do with a job? On my life as I sit here now, deadpan. So I asked them to repeat the question because I thought there's a context here which I yeah. completely haven't picked up on, right? I've either tuned out for a minute or I've not understood. And they said, we'd need to ask you how you choose to discipline your children. And I said, in the context of if there's a problem at work or we've got um, a HR issue at work, what, what's my style of dealing with difficult situations? You know, is that what you're asking? So I tried to clarify. No. How do you discipline your children? Do you shout at them? Do you smack them? Do you do all of this? And I'll, I just said, that's a question I've never been asked before and would never it expect to be asked by a business. And I don't quite understand it. And I think culturally we're not going to fit. So I thank you for your time and we'll leave it there. So again, it wasn't funny, but perhaps it's a bit funny now when I think back at it. But I was like, there's, there are... I just could not get my breath. And I literally came home to Emma after I'd seen Paul. Um, <laughs> and, Paul and Paul would be like, yeah, yeah, we could do this, that, and the other. So I felt a bit better about the day because the second bit had gone, had gone better. But I came home and I said, you know, I know I need to start earning soon because I left computer centre. <laughs> <So I'm laughs> yeah, <fine. but> <laughs> I've walked out the interview and this is why. And, I, and and she was fine. And I was like very grateful that I hadn't completely misjudged the situation. But isn't it weird that I'm going back now 15, 16 years and I can replay that like it was yesterday. Was that for a partner, another partner? It was for a reseller. Yeah. It was for a reseller. And Mark, I was like, do you know when you think I've walked into some kind of parallel universe? Then? I think I know who that reseller is. I'm, yeah. We'll talk about that offline. Yeah, I think I, I, I'm gonna, I'm, <laughs> do you know what? Do you know what, Lee? We'll close the interview there because I think I'm going to ask you offline that what is. But Lee, you've been a great guest. Thanks very much for your time. A pleasure, Mark. <laughs>